Hi, welcome to Naptime Nutrition, take two. This is Yafi Lavover, registered dietitian nutritionist and owner of Baby Bloom Nutrition and Naptime Nutrition and Toddler Test Kitchen. And with me today is Bracha Halberstadt, MSW, and we're going to be talking about overcoming the thin ideal while parenting. Thank you so much for joining me today, Bracha. Thank you so much for having me. So first, what is the thin ideal? Great. So I think that the ideal is really what what the kind of the message is that um, the media is putting on us as um, the way we're supposed to be look, looking, um, the way we're supposed to look. Um, and I think that included in it, you know, obviously the word thin, it's talking about our body size, but it's also in general, it's about all the pressures, about um, all different areas of beauty that the media kind of puts on us as this is how women should look. Yeah, and that's been a really big topic of conversation, especially through 2021, when it started coming out um, a lot of, of social racial inequities in the medical system and our thin ideal, the ideal way we are supposed to look, quote unquote, isn't isn't something that's that's applicable to all races. It's not applicable to different types of cultures. It is very homogenous it really does belong i mean that all of this all of this research was really only done on thin white men and that's very very limiting but we're coming at this from a different angle that's a valuable conversation super important conversation uh, we are talking today about how you can recognize the problems in the thin ideal and how you can overcome them and how parenting can get in the way of that and how we can deal with those additional aspects as well. So first let's talk about how we can overcome the thin ideal. How can we really embrace that this one body type and body size doesn't fit all and might not be an appropriate goal? Um, to add in, you know, your thoughts, but I think we all kind of agree, and I'm not here talking from the medical standpoint because I'm not a medical professional or a dietitian, um, but I think um, we all kind of know and understand or we're learning more and more about how um, trying to push ourselves and shame ourselves into a different size, um, not only does it not work, and that's also looking at it more from the nutritional perspective, um, but it also ends up leading to a lot of negative feelings and a very negative relationship with our bodies and our and our food intake and all of that. Um, so right now what I was um, hoping to talk about is a few different strategies that can help us um, become more comfortable in our body size. Um, and because body image is something so complicated, I never think it's just like one talk that can, you know, fix things. Um, but a few, I think there are a few things that I, you know, like to look at. And the first one is understanding how, um, like I mentioned before, how media really, really um, impacts the way we view our bodies. And that's, um, it's so, it's so frightening. And this is, comes on a level from on body image, diet culture um, is a billion dollar industry for a reason. Um, it keeps us coming back in this shame cycle. So we keep giving them more and more money. And the beauty industry in general um, makes so much money feeding off of our shame. Um, I think it's something very important to look at and to recognize that kind of we like buy into people's marketing scams and schemes. Um, and we let people make a lot of money off our insecurities and we allow media to create more insecurities from ourselves for ourselves. Um, so Brene Brown always talks about how the first step to combating shame is to really, really recognize, um, like who's profiting off my shame, who's making money off that, and therefore who is creating more shame for us so we continue to buy their products. Um, there's actually something so interesting. Um, I just went away with several friends who are in the marketing, um, field, and they told me something so interesting about, um, it, apparently, in the 1940s, women were not shaving their legs. And what happened was, tell me if you knew this, I thought this was so interesting. But what happened was, um, during World War II, um, the guys were all at war, and the shaver companies were not making enough money. So they started putting out ads with beautiful women with shaved legs. And guess what? Here, we'll, here we all are, um, you know, 70 years later. And like, with this... Um, 
with a certain standard that like you cannot go below. And that is literally all because of a few marketing people. So <laughs> I think it's so crazy how we buy into messages and we allow ourselves to be shamed, but it, it it's so pervasive and it's not just on a media level. It also then comes down to a community level. Um, you know, you can't get married until you're X size and um, family levels. And I think that the first step is recognizing like, whose shame are we holding on to? Who's benefiting from it? Um, and why are like why are we continuing to hold on to it? So I think that's like really the first step. I think it's a really important point with the marketing and another yeah, example I'll bring up. Oh, <laughs> sorry, there's a lag. Um, something that I wanted to add to that was kale. So kale is like the poster child for healthy food these days, right? When you want to talk about something healthy, kale is always the example. Kale has sweatshirts and bumper stickers. And how did that all come about? It was because of marketing, because the first push came from the, the Kale Growers Association of America, which no kale farmer recognizes as an actual organization. That was a front for a group of of lawyers and marketers who wanted to push kale. And guess what? It was super successful. And now kale going from like Red Lobster was the number one purchaser of kale before and they were using it only as a garnish. Now, all of a sudden kale is the healthy food, right? And like, you're not healthy if you don't eat kale. And it, <laughs> And it was all marketing. It's all someone decides to push this product and we all buy into it. The same can be said of engagement rings. The same can be said of a lot of different things in our society that someone decided this is how it is and pushes it. And so that's that's our body size. Not to say, not to say that we're not advocating health. We're just advocating a more comprehensive view of health that's not limited to the physical, that takes into account the spiritual and the emotional and every aspect of health. And that is, that is not the tack that's taken by the weight loss industry. We as intuitive eating guides help people to view weight as a symptom as opposed to a problem in and of itself. So what do I mean by that? Picture you're sneezing. You have you have allergies, you're sneezing. So you can hold your nose so that you don't sneeze. But does that get rid of your allergies? No, it gets rid of the sneezing. The sneezing is not the problem unless you're trying to give a webinar, then the sneezing is the problem. But the sneezing is a symptom of the allergies, much like weight can be a symptom of something that's much different, something that's underlying, something that deserves to be addressed in and of itself. And so that's the angle that we're taking with this. Society does not get to determine what your biochemical levels are in your blood. Society does not get to determine your vitamin D or your B12 or your CRP or your A1C, or I can just keep throwing three letter um, words at you. But <laughs> society doesn't get to determine that by telling you that it's healthier to be thin. Because you know what? That is not always the case. And it's not a great way to pursue meaningful health in a sustainable and long-term way. Yafi, yeah, that is so fascinating. Um, but about the kale, first of all, it's like sticking in my head because even while knowing that like, you know, even, even from a place of understanding that there isn't one food that's like the cure all and the food that's going to be like giving you the optimal health, I still feel like a giraffe superior when I eat kale. So wow, that like, I did not know where that craze even came from. So thanks for sharing that. I learned something new. Are we moving on to, um, point two of just something to consider? in terms of body image. Um, moving on to the second piece, uh, which I think is very, very important to look at. And that's something that, um, I don't know why, but it's barely ever discussed, um, or I have not seen it discussed enough. But because society puts such an emphasis on a certain body size and a certain way of looking, um, and because science proves that there's no um, long-term way of intentionally um, losing weight I mean, from specifically through the pursuit of weight, weight loss in and of itself, um, you know, we want to get to a body acceptance from the way our bodies are. Um, but the, the thing nobody talks about or it's not spoken about enough is that in order to get to acceptance, there is a grief process. And we know this with, you know, when you're dealing with more like the typical losses, like the death of a loved one or something like that, we know we need to grieve. And I think that it's really, really important to realize that it's the same thing. So it's understanding that you know, 
the, the because there's this thin ideal, we come what we live life with a certain dream, right? When we are X size, we're gonna find the love we're waiting for. We're gonna find the job, the money, the the everything, and you know that thinness is going to come with a certain you know everything perfect, and we're gonna finally be good enough. And obviously, in our heads, it's not always so like clear crystal cut what we're chasing but there's kind of this like pink fluffy cloud like when i am thin i will finally be good enough and when i am thin i will finally be comfortable in my skin and when i am thin i will you know all of that um and whether or not that dream is true and you know <laughs> reality shows that it is not but um it's a loss it's a loss to let go of a dream that we are sometimes chasing for decades um and i think that grief and grief looks different for everyone and we all grieve in different ways but i think that recognizing that and allowing ourselves to feel that pain um the pain for a dream that will not become reality and also the pain of living in a society that um, will continue to fight us and the pain of the knowledge that we perhaps fought our own bodies for years and all of these things are things that deserve space and deserve time and you know, should be like, we should allow that sadness to exist. Um, and it's a stage that can take different amount of times for different people um, until the acceptance sets in. And that's like a normal appropriate process that many of us have to go through. I think that's just a very important thing to acknowledge. It's a really great point um, that we we have these ideas on how our life is going. I'm not hearing you, Yafi. I'm not sure if you're <laughs> You should be hearing me now. Um, yeah. There, it's really important to leave space for for grieving um I'm hearing for, you now. for grieving the loss of something that you had wanted i mean there are all kinds of dreams that we have to say goodbye to as we grow up you know like you start your life wanting to be an astronaut well i mean not everyone becomes an astronaut but a lot of kids want to be and so we're kind of used to that as we grow up we say goodbye to certain dreams and as we realize that they're not um, those dreams don't meet who we are as people or they're not reasonable. You know, like you're not going to be an astronaut and the president of the United States and a doctor all at the same time. We, As we grow, we realize that we're growing out of the idea that that is something that's going to happen, that that's something that's accessible, or that's something that's even something that's reasonable. And so this, the idea that you should be a certain size can join the pile of, of other dreams that we have grown out of as we start to realize that we can take on a more comprehensive view of health and we don't have to torture ourselves into a certain body size. We can focus on other aspects of our personalities. We, we can focus on strengths and we can focus on more meaningful paths toward health as opposed to being a certain size. Yeah, that's such a great point you're making over there about how um, it's really part of growing up letting go of like cloudy, bunny, pink clouds is really, really a part of growing up and all those dreams and fantasies that we let go of, we sometimes forget that um, a, you know, very, very um, one size body size um, is the, you know, is one of those dreams too. So I think that's, you know, a really great way of putting that. Um, and moving on to the next point, which was um, because um, society still has a fairly narrow, um, view on what we should be looking like um and thankfully that has been expanding and there are, are you know more plus size models and more people who are you know creating body positive accounts i think it's very important for us to find um representatives that are more similar to what we look like um so that can include like just following body positive accounts on instagram that show bodies that are more similar to our own whether it's in size whether it's in color whether it's you know specific characteristics that are often um you know just it's just important to find those um to find the kind of representatives and it, it it's all about really just understanding that beauty looks beauty doesn't come in one package there are many many um you know forms of beauty um and finding yeah, following and finding accounts that really kind of resonate more with us. I think that's really an important piece too. Okay, so yeah, it's really great to find beautiful images of of people who look more like you, like how you look now, not like how you look in your goal. Um, it's it's important because in different different areas of the world and different points in time, beauty was seen as different and. It changed based on how society waxed and waned and the, the messages that were being sent by different societies at different points of time in different places. And so we can just take that power back. 
We can say, I'm not going to be floating in the waves of society with this. I'm going to take charge of what is around me and what I see. And so by do, by following Bracha's advice, by, by having coffee table art that features women who look more like you or who are bigger than you, um, that can really help shift your perspective because what we see is what we identify as normal. And if you have Cosmopolitan magazine and in shape and whatever else with all of these unreasonable expectations or not reasonable for you expectations, then that's what your body, that's, that's what your mind sees and makes normal for you. You can choose a new normal. And this again is not about letting yourself go. It's about taking charge of who you are and pursuing health from a more comprehensive and sustainable path. So that's not what we're not about ditching health. We are about changing what what you see and what you hear to make it more normal, to make the beauty around you more representative of what is actually in society as opposed to the, the smoke and mirrors that society is trying to give us. Yeah, thanks. And I like I like that you reiterated that this isn't about ditching health. Um, and I feel like this is this is often a misconception that if we shame ourselves enough. Um, we will be able to shame ourselves into change. And, you know, we're not, aside from the fact we're not looking at, at health and weight as something that is, you know, completely correlated, um, but we also want to recognize that we cannot, it's impossible for us to shame ourselves into better behaviors or better health um, regardless. Um, so recognizing that if we allow ourselves to be surrounded by things that will lessen and reduce our shame, that actually is, um, going to increase our health automatically. And that's, you know, important thing for, you know, just on the health perspective. I think that's so important. And so your fourth point was separating out your worth from what you look like. And I love that. So could you take that and run with it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it's actually interesting. I recently had a conversation with someone who she kind of told me, she's like, look, she's a beautiful girl. And she's like, I know I'm beautiful. Um, I still think I have an issue with my body image. Does that make sense? And I knew exactly what she meant. Um, she was so spot on. And for her, she was recognizing that if she would go into an event, she would walk into a wedding. She was kind of viewing her body as this asset. She knew she was beautiful. She knew she could make heads turn. Um, and it started becoming like her body was an asset. And I agree with her the same way somebody who, regardless of what their body looks like, is not satisfied with their body. Um, that's an issue with their body image. Somebody who walks around the whole day um, feeling like their looks are their asset. That is, it's the same, it's the other side of the same coin. Um, and, you know, sometimes people think that um, having a healthy body image is about loving the way you look and loving every part of your body. And I actually do not think that's the case. I think having a healthy body image is about tolerating and accepting our bodies and recognizing that what our bodies look like um, and the number on the scale has literally zero to do with who we are as human beings. Our bodies house us. They hopefully do a good job of getting us through life. Um, but we hope that our bodies are like the least interesting thing about us. Um, so I really think that there are so many things to do in letting go of our letting go of society's messages and and letting go of of you know certain expectations and norms and all the emotions that come with it and you know there's so many different pieces there but I do think that one of the most important things is um, getting to know ourselves. So it's not just about becoming okay with the body that houses us, but really getting to know who we are, what makes us thrive, what gives us meaning, what what are we passionate about, um, and sometimes it might mean taking on new hobbies and um, you know, creating new avenues of meaning in our lives, um, building new relationships, all of these things and deepening all the things that, you know, our body helps us do and be, um, but taking the focus away from our bodies. Because ultimately, when we have a healthy relationship with our body, it's not like we go around thinking the whole day, like, ooh, I'm the prettiest. We go around the whole day, hopefully not thinking about our bodies that much. Um, so I think that's like a very, very important thing to continue working toward. Um, and I will give that disclaimer again that, um, living in a society that puts such an emphasis on looks and weight, something that's really, really difficult. And I don't think that it's like a one day to the next, like, oh, we just drop the focus and switch our focus inward. I think it's a continuous thing. And I think it's something that we have our good days and we have our bad days. Um, but overall, um, I believe, and I have seen with, you know, through helping people that 
um, the more of the focus is, is turned inward and not about like, it's not about loving every aspect of our body, but it's about being okay with our body because we know it houses us. I mean, getting to a place of where we're really, really okay with who we are. I think that that goal is a lot more sustainable um, and also gets us to a, you know, a, a much deeper and richer life. I totally agree. And I'm going to bring up something political that um, just, just because this big, big thing happened, and I think it perfectly illustrates what you're talking about. So I don't, this is not me endorsing any particular party or actions or people. This is just, uh, you, you'll get it, stick with me. Recently, Kamala Harris was sworn in as the first female Black Asian Vice President of the United States. She was sworn in by Sandra Sotomayor, the first Hispanic female Supreme Court judge, right? Why didn't they announce any of their weights? <laughs> It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they weigh. It does not matter what they weigh. Okay, I'm going to say that again. It does not matter what they weigh because these two strong women, whether you agree with their decisions or not, these two strong women fought tooth and nail to get to where they are. They represent extreme forward motion in in social justice, in woman power, in in minority power. And it doesn't matter what they weigh because it's completely irrelevant. And what you can accomplish with your life, guess what? Your weight is also irrelevant to that. And this is a great exercise to do just on your own or if you have kids to do it with them if there have been some, some concerns expressed, particularly in the prepubescent um, pubescent period. Make a list of people you respect. Talk about why you respect them. And I can tell you, their size is not going to be on that list because it's not meaningful. It's their size does not contribute to humanity. And the thing is that these we are all doing amazing things. Even if even if the only thing you're doing is maintaining your sanity through this whole ridiculous situation, you are doing amazing things and your weight is irrelevant. Okay? Amazing. I love the way you said that, um, Yafi. I love the way you pointed out over there that, like, yes, we do not announce those weights. Um, so important. And you're also reminding me um, in terms of, like, finding people, like, to look at as role models for reasons other than their weight. Um, I help clients sometimes put together, like, a, a body image toolkit, of, like, what to do on those, like, hard days, those tough days. And one of the things I have them write down beforehand is a list of people that, like they admire and they look up to for reasons obviously other than their body. Um, I think it's just so important. We don't, we don't, we, I hope we don't view other people um, by their bodies. And it's kind of a double standard because we sometimes put our own worth to that. Um, so I think that's a great point you made over there. Thank you. I think the most important thing so far is your, your body is the least yeah. interesting thing about you. Your weight is boring. It's the least interesting thing about you. You are a fascinating person who has a lot to say. And talk about diet is boring. And yeah, great. You look wonderful in that dress. That is the least important thing about you. So now we brought you to this place where obviously yeah. you're just in love with yourself all of a sudden, right? No, we, as, as Bracha mentioned, that's a daily choice that you make. That is a daily choice to get up and, and choose to see yourself in a positive light, to see yourself as the powerful person that you are. But what happens when you become a parent? Sometimes you really fight to get rid of all of this body image stuff, and then you have infertility, or you're pregnant, or you're breastfeeding, or you're doing food introduction, and all of these issues come back. They just come rushing at you. Okay, awesome. I, I thought that must be yes. Um, okay, so I think that it's it's important to look at this um, kind of with each challenge that comes up. First of all, parenting will bring up all all of our um, regular insecurities, um, body image, and challenges with food and eating, and all these kind of things are things that, especially for those of us who are. Um, it's almost like some people are kind of predisposed to it, like this might be our go-to way of dealing with stress um, because body image and, and challenges with food is never really about the body or about the food. So for some of us, this is kind of our go-to challenge. Um, so especially if this is something you struggled with in the past, you could kind of expect 
challenges in general, but especially parenting and motherhood and all of that to bring up these things. Um, I would honestly address each of these separately, but I do think that it's important to acknowledge the overall um, factor that I just see as the, the big factor here with this shame um, is kind of the just the glaring red line that I see over here. Um, I'm a huge fan of Brittany Brown, so I feel like I'm just going to keep saying her name. Um, but she talks about how there are, like, I think she says there are eight categories of shame. And just three of those major categories are things we just touched on. Um, and that is um, appearance and body image and motherhood and parenting and health. And when you have even just one of these, you know, these are like the the shame triggers for women. Even just one of these is enough to like kind of put you through the shame roof. Um, but when you have this combination where you're struggling with, you know, struggling to conceive or you're, um, you know, just gave birth and dealing with a postpartum body and trying to get into the hang of breastfeeding, these are kind of just um, great petri dishes to create this like new boatload of shame because us as women clearly don't have enough of it. Um, so I, I think I kind of look at this the same way we look at well, other ways of shame, um, recognizing what messages we're holding on to. Um, and I think the huge, huge big thing over here is always going to be reaching out and telling other people, like sharing your story. Um, because so often we like hold on to ideas of shame, usually that have no logic and make no sense. Um, and at the very least we think we're the only one, cause that's what shame is. Shame tells us like, we're the only one who's wrong, bad, our body's wrong, our, you know, everyone else has it, you know, can get through the stage easily, whatever piece it is and recognizing calling up somebody else who's in a similar space um, and recognizing you're, we're usually not going to be alone. That's kind of the nature of it. And that already um, empathy is what kills shame. So I would say that that is often can be the first big step. Empathy is what kills shame. I love that. That's amazing. I, I usually say that laughter kills anxiety. So I really like that empathy kills shame. That That goes nicely. I, and I think that when you're talking about sharing your story, that's just another angle on surrounding yourself with images of beautiful, larger people. I mean, we feel like our body is unique in a bad way. And then we feel like our, our struggles are unique in a bad way because we're not surrounding ourselves with images of beautiful people who resemble us. And we're not hearing stories of people who are going through similar struggles. So the best thing that we can do is after going through a struggle, talk about it because someone else needs to hear it. Someone else needs that struggle to be normalized so that they can feel empowered to get help. I mean, I, I recently started on an anti-anxiety medication and that's something that people don't really talk about. But you know what? Why not? Why not? I bet that pharmaceutical sales on antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications are through the roof. And guess what? It's not just due to me. So I'm going to say it. I am now on a prescription to help with anxiety. You know, that doesn't have to do directly with what we're talking about. But it's just the fact that there are certain things that we feel like we need to hide. And we don't need to hide them. In fact, we shouldn't hide them because other people need to hear that they're not alone. First of all, congratulations on taking care of yourself. Um, and thank you for sharing that. Um, but I think that's such a great point, the way you you created that analogy, um, kind of, or that connection between, um, you know, following body positive people on, on social media and sharing just within our own circle of friends. And yeah, I also like that point that you brought in. We're doing ourselves a huge favor and we're really doing that favor um, to everyone else around us. And I feel like every time I share something that I feel like I'm going to die of shame from telling it to someone, then not only do I feel so much better after, but not only the reaction is like, oh my God, thanks so much for saying that. It's not only me. So yeah, as human beings, I think we just think that everybody else has their stuff together more. And it's just usually not true. Right. And I think that that's a really good point. I think that's very important to remember. It's, it's, an, it's, it's an essential point to remember, particularly right now, particularly for parents who just became new parents. Because you know what? Usually you would be able to go out to the supermarket and see someone else's kid screaming. You would go to the park and see other postnatal moms wearing the, the frumpy clothes that come in between the pregnancy and going back to normal clothes. You would see that other people are tired. You would see that other people are overextended. You would see that other people's babies also cry. 
We don't have that. We have people who are isolated in their houses with their newborn, looking at other people's Facebook and other people's Instagram with no connection to the fact that other people's babies also poop everywhere all the time. And it's so isolating. And so it's important to connect on that personal level if just to have a more accurate comparison where I'm comparing my health or your health. You know what? We've all been there. <laughs> yeah, I love the way you said that. And, the, you know, the comparisons on social media, especially in this time of isolation, is so um, it's so unhelpful. Um, and I think it's also just because you touched on, you know, other be kids, babies, other people's babies poop. Um, and it's also important to recognize the things that we, um, you know, the, like our personal struggles in terms of, let's say, um, every, almost no, almost nobody will have an easy time where their bodies will naturally go back to their original size after birth and things like that. Things that um, for some reason we have these expectations, like it should, like the baby's out, the way it should be, get, the way it should be gone. Um, your body took nine months to change in one direction and we kind of didn't expect it to like switch back. Um, so all of these are things to just recognize that for the most part, if you're dealing with something, you're probably not alone. It's very true. It's very true. And I have nap time nutrition segments on so much of these little points. We've got nap time nutrition segments on picky eating and nap time nutrition segments on um, fashion through pregnancy and breastfeeding and honoring your body. Um, having trouble losing weight while breastfeeding. I've got a segment on that. The, Nobody is alone in these struggles, okay? It, we're, we're told a certain line. Okay, for instance, the line from society is breastfeeding will help you lose weight. Well, guess what? One in five women will not lose weight while breastfeeding. One in five, 20% of people. That seems a little significant to me. I don't know, but the line from society is breastfeed and you will lose weight. Guess what? That's not why you breastfeed, okay? And maybe it's not going to happen. And there is a complex set of biological rules that will determine whether you will lose weight or not, whether it will come off quickly or not, whether you will gain weight, um, or if your baby is going to scream every time you eat a piece of corn. There's a lot going on, and it's important to know that you're not alone, and this is biologically natural. So getting back to the whole overcoming the thin ideal while parenting. Absolutely. No matter whether you dabbled with dieting or had a full-blown eating disorder and consider yourself recovered, when you have children, it comes back. So heads up, it comes back because you have to put so much focus into it. A lot of times when we're getting out of this whole um, restrictive eating type of situation, we get more into focusing on other aspects of our personality, other aspects of our lives, other things right. that make us important. All the stuff we've talked about in this in this podcast up until now. Um, but the thing is that when you have a baby, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, number one, let's say infertility. I had a four-year infertility journey and I felt like my body did not work. It's an awful feeling, but the thing is that I had overcome a lot of thoughts and now I have to think so much about my body. I have to think about when am I ovulating and I need to do this shot and I we need to schedule sex on this day. And you, it brings so much focus to it. And then when you get pregnant, oh yes, I had twins. You need to gain 20 pounds in your first trimester. Guess what? I gained five. You're nauseous. Okay, but the, the focus, I found out I was having twins and went straight to GNC and bought a bunch of protein powder. I didn't even open it. It went straight in the trash like 10 years later. But point is, your focus is so much on your body, on your weight, on your food, on your vitamins. And then it gets worse. It doesn't get better. You have this baby. And you know what? A lot of people think the baby weighed eight pounds. I should have only gained eight pounds. No, I have a nap time nutrition on that one too, of all the stuff that's going on. But you have a baby and then you have to heal. And then guess what? You have an entirely new identity. You know what? Yesterday, yesterday, you were Susan. And today, you are mommy. It changes everything across the board. And so you're trying to take care of yourself. If you're breastfeeding, you have increased needs of about 500 calories per day, but you're not sleeping. And guess what? How are you going to cook if you're not sleeping? And there's a baby who's like drooling on you all the time. You have increased needs and less ability to meet your increased needs. But guess what? 
the focus is still there. And then at about six months, you start feeding the baby. And what should I feed them? And what order should I feed them? And should I separate foods by two or three days or seven days or not at all? Or baby led weaning or purees? And I'm going to screw this child up. And the focus is so much on the food. And so anything that you have worked to overcome in your life comes rushing at you like a wrecking ball. And we're here to tell you it's normal. <laughs> That was all so well said. And I think it's also important to continue talking about, um, you know, when, once you're feeding that child, then it's almost like we want to do better with our children. And we want to make sure that our children aren't going to have to um, deal with, you know, all that noise and mess around food and body. But when we're still dealing with that new wave of aftermath of, you know, food stuff and body stuff, um, and then it, it creates this like hyper focus. And then like, oh my gosh, my kid isn't eating there or whatever, or my kid's weight, you know, kind of fluctuated. And that can also bring up that anxiety. Again, like, is, you know, is my kid, am I raising my kid normal? And am I a mess up to the next generation also? And that can just bring like a second wave of anxiety or a third. I don't know what we're up to right now. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. And it's sometimes it really feels like motherhood is just an exercise in mediocrity. Um, <laughs> but you think that everyone else is doing it right. And so I'm here to tell you, nobody else is doing it more right than you. It's fine. Everyone is doing an equally, equally uh, wonderful job. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, so Bracha, what do you think is the number one thing for new parents to know or people who are about to get into that journey? What's so important for them to know? Uh, like if you could come up with one thing. Um, good question. And I would, I would think that really I would go right back to before. Um, you're going to have days that are pretty sucky and very unmagazine recovery worthy. Um, definitely not Instagram worthy. And that's okay. Like that is part of being human. Um, that's actually like more part of being human than the perfect days are part of being human. And um, yeah, ride with it. Recognize that it doesn't mean that you're like uniquely weird or messed up. It probably means you're pretty normal um, and you know reach out talk about it um, get yourself help I think that's also such a big thing like if you can afford cleaning help get cleaning help if you you know if, if therapy is an important thing for you please get yourself like find a good therapist like we're not supposed to do all of this on our own and you know keep building your communities your friends who you can talk about these things with because it is a struggle I totally agree well, thank you so much for joining us today. Please tell our audience where they can find you. Sure. Um, okay, so I'm not really um, very easily accessible on social media at the moment, um, but I can be emailed at brachahal, B-R-A-C-H-A-H-A-L-V-1-7 at gmail.com. Um, and thank you so much for having me on, Yafi. This was so much fun. Thanks. Well, I hope we had a very positive impact, and I'm going to go eat some lunch because because it's almost dinner time. But thank you so much for joining me. It was wonderful having you on. And for anyone who is watching Naptime Nutrition or listening to it, um, the schedule has been a little bit sporadic, but that's just been life lately. So if you have any questions or comments or concerns, you can comment below on YouTube or on the podcast, or you can email me always at yafi at babybloomnutrition.com. And I will be back next time. And I can't tell you when that's going to be, but I will be taking care of myself in the meantime. And I hope you will too. And you too, Bracha. I hope you take care of yourself as well. Thanks, Yaffe. You too.